Welcome to MedMark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled, Safety in the MRI Suite, Considerations for Medical Devices and Equipment. I'm Kate Cloud, Staff Attorney in MedMark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of MedMark and today's presenter, Dr. Joshua White, thank you for joining us. Dr. Joshua White's experience includes identifying risks associated with medical devices in and around MRI scanners. He frequently assists clients to develop custom protocols for performing MRI compatibility testing according to the relevant ASTM and ISO standards based on the risk profile of the device. While at Exponent, Dr. White has, assist has assisted clients with responses to inquiries from both the FDA and international notified bodies related to their MRI compatibility assessments. Dr. White is knowledgeable in particle analysis of orthopedic and cardiovascular medical devices. He's experienced in the generation of particles using benchtop methods, including pin-on-disc testing, simulator testing, and torturous track models. For particles embedded in tissue or wear fluid, he is also well-versed in isolation, isolation techniques that rely on both chemical and enzyme-based approaches. Dr. White is also skilled with particle characterization techniques, including scanning electron microscopy, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, dynamic light scattering and light obscuration, and inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy. Dr. White is also experienced with the execution of medical device retrieval programs that incorporate his knowledge of biomaterials, tissue assays, and, sur and surface characterization techniques to evaluate devices and associated animal cadaveric and human tissues. He has helped clients establish international device and tissue retrieval programs in accordance with ASTM, ISO, and IATA standards. As such, he has evaluated device performance and performed failure analysis of devices at the preclinical, clinical, and post-market surveillance phases of the total product life cycle. And with that, I am pleased to turn things over to Josh. Thanks, Kate, and thanks also to Medmark for having me today. I'd like to wish you all a good morning or a good afternoon, and also thank you for taking part in the presentation today. So with that, I'd like to start with the end in mind. Specifically, why do we care about MRI safety, and why is it important in the context of medical devices and medical equipment? To that end, let's start briefly with an example of what can go wrong when the appropriate safety testing is not conducted or the appropriate clinical safeguards are not put in place. Approximately one year ago, you may have read this story about a gentleman that died as a result of what's called a projectile missile incident. In this situation, the gentleman was carrying a ferromagnetic oxygen cylinder into the MRI scanner suite, and because of the extremely strong magnetic forces present in the room, the gas cylinder was rapidly pulled into the MRI scanner. In essence, as the name implies, it turned the gas cylinder into a projectile missile. The man who was holding onto the cylinder was also pulled along with it and ended up dying as a result of the injuries he sustained from the incident. Such an incident shows the importance of following relevant standards and best practices to ensure MRI safety. The other thing to note here, and something we'll discuss in greater detail later, is the statement in the report from the FDA MAUD database related to safety directions as presented in the instructions for use. This is significant because the end output of, of all MRI compatibility testing is a set of labeling recommendations that are incorporated into the instructions for use for the MRI scanner, medical device, and or medical equipment. Such labeling is extremely important to communicate to healthcare providers whether or not certain medical devices are safe to scan inside a patient and whether equipment is safe to bring around the MRI scanner. So before we get into too many of the specifics of MRI testing, I'd like to take a step back to discuss product development as a whole. Here at Exponent in the Biomedical Engineering Group, we are routinely helping clients at all phases of the total product life cycle. So early on, for example, we often assist with medical and, and economic assessments, QMS gap analysis, and technology landscaping. And as products advance through the pre-market testing stages, we often aid with the test method development, execution of benchtop testing according to international standards in our ISO 17025 accredited labs. Uh, we perform evaluation of specimens from preclinical testing, computational fluid dynamics, for the evaluation of thrombogenicity and hemolysis, finite element analysis, and design validation. We frequently also assist clients with US FDA and international regulatory submissions, and once devices are in commercial use, also perform post-market surveillance, device retrieval analysis, medical device reporting, failure analysis, and health economics 
economics research, to name a few. In the broader scope of device development, MRI testing is applied to all medical devices, including devices intended for use in the applications shown here. So although we perform MRI safety and compatibility testing at all phases of the total product life cycle, we most frequently do the testing during the preclinical stages, as well as during regulatory submission and commercial use phases. Of those two, the most common area that we're asked to, to perform safety and compatibility testing is just before or during regulatory submission. We see this request from both the United States FDA and more recently have been seeing an increasing number of requests to perform MRI testing, MRI testing as a result of the European MDR, which requires medical device manufacturers to include the appropriate warnings, precautions, and labeling with regards to common external influences such as magnetic fields, and external electric and electromagnetic effects, as you might find in MRI scanners. So MRI safety and compatibility testing is incredibly important to ensure patient safety. MR imaging is one of several clinic clinical imaging modalities used for patient diagnosis, including x-ray, CT scanning, ultrasound imaging, and pet, pet imaging, to name a few. MR imaging, which offers great sp spatial resolution without exposing patients to harmful radiation, has become increasingly adopted since the 1980s. Recently, for example, in the United States, it was estimated that approximately 30 to 40 million MRI scans were performed in 2015. At the same time, more and more patients are implanted with medical devices. As an example, it's been estimated that in the United States, that approximately 370,000 patients receive cardiac pacemakers every year, and that 1 million patients receive total hip or total knee replacements every year. Because there's been a significant increase in the use of MRI scanners in clinical practice, and because there are increasingly more patients that have medical devices, the likelihood of a patient with a medical device and subsequently undergoing MRI evaluations is, is very high. So how does a manufacturer go about ensuring their implanted device can be safely scanned, or how can an equipment manufacturer ensure their equipment can be safely used in an MRI scanner suite? An important point to make is that MRI safety and compatibility testing is a crucial part of the entire device manufacturer risk management process. Frequently, we speak with manufacturers that have received feedback from their notified bodies asking them to perform uh, testing according to relevant standards. The interpretation of the feedback that we often hear is that they are simply required to test their device against the ASTM and ISO standards. In many of those cases, the emphasis is, is placed on the execution of testing. However, what we want to emphasize here is that it's important to, to instead emphasize the, the patient safety and, and risk analysis. Ultimately, all MRI safety and compatibility testing is performed to demonstrate that when a device is exposed to an MRI environment, that it will not, will not malfunction or cause risk to the patient undergoing the MRI exam. As such, the first part of any MRI safety evaluation is to deter, define the potential risks that exposure of the device to an MRI environment may have on the patient. So more broadly at a high level, there are generally four types of risks that arise from the use of MRI. Cryogens, general application of MRI, contrast agents, and device-specific risks. Although the focus of our discussion today will be device-related, I want to spend at least a few moments here to address the other's uh, concerns to give a more comprehensive look at MRI safety in general. First, with respect to cry cryogens, MRI systems are cooled by generally liquid helium. Liquid helium, for those of you that are aware, uh, has a temperature of approximately minus 270 degrees Celsius or approximately minus 452 degrees Fahrenheit. As you can imagine, Handling and storage of such a liquid requires significant safeguards to ensure that it's done correctly. Exposure or inadvertent release of liquid helium could easily lead to frostbite or asphyxiation, while improper storage could lead to explosions due to the buildup of pressure. There are also risks associated with general use of MRI systems, such as thermal and auditory risk to patients undergoing scans. MRI can cause patients' temperatures to increase, and in some patients, including pregnant mothers, may require additional safety measures to allow them to go undergo an MRI. Furthermore, although MR images are often very good uh, in terms of their resolution, poor image quality due to artifact can result in misinterpretation and misdiagnosis of, of patients. Contrast agents, on the other hand, uh, can be injected into patients to improve the quality of an image from an MRI scanner. However, some patients may have adverse reactions to, to some types of contrast agents. 
As a note, in the last several years, for example, FDA has issued a safety communication pertaining to some types of those contrast agents. And, and even further, uh, there, have, there have been cases in the past involving gadolinium-based contrast agents that have also been consolidated into multi-district litigation uh, proceedings. So now that we've covered some of the other risks at a very high level here, I'd like to speak a little bit more specifically about the inner workings of MRI uh, first and then how the, uh, the functionality of those MR systems relate to device-specific hazards. So what exactly is MRI? How does it work? And how can it be a hazard to medical devices and subsequently to patients? First of all, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is a clinical imaging modality. Much like I've, I've talked about previously, X-ray, CT scans, ultrasound, and PET scans, MRI allows clinicians the ability to visualize internal organs. And unlike some other imaging modalities, MRI doesn't expose patients to radiation, which in many instances is a significant benefit compared with some of the other, the other uh, modalities that we just discussed. When we look in, at an MRI scanner, the, uh, the guts, per se, of the MR systems contain a superconducting magnet, radio frequency coils, and gradient coils, while the patient bed moves the patient in and out of the scanner bore. From a functionality perspective, the main superconducting magnet generally contains a lot of coils of wire that conduct electricity. This is a component of the system that's cooled by liquid helium that uh, allows high levels of current to flow through the coil itself, which in turn allows the system to create the strong magnetic fields that are always present, even when the machine is not scanning. Commercial, commercially available scanners often have field strengths of 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla, and recently cleared cl clinical scanners also have field strengths of upwards of 7 Tesla. The direction of the magnetic field, as you see indicated here, is into the bore and, and parallel to the scanner bore. So to provide a rough order of magnitude estimate, MRI scanners are approximately 1,000 to 10,000 times stronger than your common refrigerator magnets. Furthermore, to give a rough estimate of the strength of the magnetic field, some metal objects can be pulled so strongly that the forces acting on them are, are ranging from 60 to 250 times larger than the weights of those, the objects, of, of those objects themselves. Finally, the function of this mag, uh, main magnet is to cause alignment of hydrogen ions within the magnetic field which, as we'll discuss in a moment, are what allows MR images to be, to be obtained. So during scanning, the radio frequency coil, sometimes referred to as the RF coil, delivers electromagnetic waves and pulses that transfer energy to the hydrogen atoms. Only certain hydrogen atoms absorb and then subsequently release that energy, which is what results in an image being generated by the MRI scanner. Different tissues have different absorption and release characteristics, and as a result, different parts of a scan will have different signal intensities. The gradient coils, on the other hand, apply local perturbations in the main magnetic field, which allows spatial encoding in the X, Y, and Z directions. Ultimately, the application of all three coils simultaneously allows MR images, which are sometimes referred to as slices, to be generated. So now that we've covered some of the MR basics, uh, I'd like to touch briefly on how we characterize medical devices. So when it comes to device-related safety concerns, there's really two buckets of, of device types that are traditionally considered. Some of the risks to be considered are the same for passive and active devices, while some of the risks that are applicable to active devices may not be applicable to those passive device counterparts. So because the, device, because the types of risks associated with each device may differ, it's important to understand the differences between the two. So as the names imply, the biggest differentiating factor between the two classes of devices is the presence of a power source. Passive implants, on the one hand, have no power source, and they provide treatment strictly via their design. For example, orthopedics devices, such as hips and knees, are designed to withstand millions of cycles of loading, while drug-eluting stents are designed to elute drug at a predetermined rate based on the composition of the drug coating. Examples of these devices, as you see here, are hips, our knees, stents, heart valves, to name a few. Active devices, on the other hand, uh, have functionality that's associated with a power source that can be programmed to, ch to be changed over time. For example, neurostimulators, pacemakers, can be programmed to deliver different treat treatment regimes uh, with modified frequency of delivery, and implantable drug pumps can be programmed to deliver more or less therapy at different time points. 
Examples of these devices include, again, neurostimulators, pacemakers, and cochlear implants, to name a few. Oftentimes when we think of active devices, the other thing to, to point out is that they generally have two types of components. First is that they have the component associated with power of the device, sometimes referred to as a CAN or an IPG. And secondly, uh, the leads that extend from the IPG to the site where therapy is being delivered. So now that we've covered some of the basics of MRI, as well as some of the different classes of medical devices, let's dig a little deeper into how those two come together as part of risk analysis. So as you can imagine, hazards associated with both passive and active implants can arise from the interaction of devices with all three types of the magnetic fields in the MRI scanner. The static field, the RF field, and the gradient field. The combined interaction of all these field types can also lead to additional hazards. The potential hazards, as you see here, can be summarized as thermal, mechanical, electrical, and functional hazards to the patient. So for example, first, if we, if we talk about thermal hazards, uh, during operation of the MRI scanner, the pulsed RF and gradient fields can each cause local tissue heating. Most commonly, the, the heating is due to the induction of current flow through conductive elements of the implant. For example, uh, if you've ever touched a light bulb that has been left on for several minutes, you'll notice that it can get quite hot. The heat is due to the fact that electric current is flowing through the conductive elements of the light bulb, and as the current flows through the filament, it also encounters resistance, which causes the light bulb to get hot. In a similar manner, the switching RF and gradient fields of the MR scanner can cause current to flow through the conductive elements of the device, thereby resulting in temperature increases. And again, much like the light bulb that you find in your kitchen, as the device heats up, it then deposits that heat into the surrounding environment, in this case for the patient, the surrounding tissue. As expected, devices that demonstrate high levels of heating can result in significant tissue damage to patients, such as burns or tissue necrosis. Now, on the other hand, the interaction of magnetic fields with devices can also result in potential mechanical hazards to the patient. For example, when uh, gradient fields are applied to certain types of devices, it can cause magnetic moments within the device such that the device offer oscillates rapidly. Now, these oscillations are, are generally quite small, but since there's a, uh, they oscillate at a high frequency, they can also induce uh, vibrations to the surrounding tissue and in part damage to the local, to the local environment. Now, in a similar fashion to, uh, to what we discussed early on, the interaction of magnetic fields with, with uh, the devices themselves can cause them to move, uh, and it can also cause them to rotate. Now, you can imagine, much like the gas cylinder, if, if a device is implanted into the surrounding tissue, that if it's prone to, to moving within a patient, that it, it could impart forces onto the patient and, and cause tissue damage. Um, so as I just pointed out, this is exactly the same force that we discussed initially that leads to, to the risk of projectiles. So you can imagine if you have a device, for example, an aneurysm clip that's implanted in the brain or an ocular implant that's been, de been designed without considering MRI safety where they have the wrong materials, if they uh, undergo displacement and move within a patient, they could potentially pose a hazard to the, uh, to the brain and to the eye tissues that they're implanted in. Now, as we move on here, uh, electrical stimulation is really based on unintended stimulation of the device. So unintended stimulation represents the, the potential electrical hazards that arise from the interaction of the device with the RF and gradient fields of MR scanners. So the risk for unintended stimulation is, is most common in devices that contain leads, again, those active devices. For example, the application of both the RF and gradient fields could lead to the buildup of charge, and if enough charge builds up and flows, it could be delivered into the surrounding tissue. Imagine, for example, when you walk around in your socks and you develop a static charge. When you then reach out and touch someone, you deliver a shock to them. You can imagine that a pacemaker or neurostimulator that builds up a charge in a similar manner may end up delivering an electrical pulse to the surrounding tissue. Obviously, if that pulse is too large or delivered at the wrong time, it could cause the heart to contract out of rhythm, or it could cause the brain to send unwanted signals to the body, for example. 
Device malfunction, as the name implies, is directly related to performance and functional ability to deliver the correct therapy. Any of the fields generated by MRI or the simultaneous application of those fields could lead to device malfunction. Now, when we think about malfunction, it's really, really broad in terms of the performance issues that it covers, such as changes in delivery of therapy, reduced efficacy, or total loss of function. You could imagine, for example, an implantable drug pump that malfunctions during an MRI may lead to a large bolus delivery of drug or stop the delivery of drug altogether, both of which could lead to serious adverse events for a patient. Image artifact, uh, unlike the other hazards, is not necessarily a direct risk to the patient, but rather it poses a risk to the patient because the presence of artifact around a medical device can cause a radiologist or clinician to, to incorrectly read the images where the device is implanted. In such, case, in such cases, the radiologist could potentially misdiagnose the patient, which would subsequently lead to the patient receiving incorrectly prescribed or delayed therapy. Ultimately, for each hazard type described here, it's up to the manufacturer to determine if each hazard poses a risk to the patient and how, may, how best to mitigate the risk to the patient by either designing safety into the device or providing the appropriate labeling to guide safe scanning procedures. So now that we've covered uh, the identification of risks, how does a manufacturer go about testing the device or medical equipment for MRI safety and compatibility? The good news for manufacturers submitting to the United States FDA, for example, is that they have provided guidance about the relevant considerations for performing MRI safety and compatibility testing. For example, a manufacturer must provide rationale for test conditions, acceptance criteria, and why a certain device undergoing evaluation is representative of the worst case that could be evaluated. Furthermore, FDA and notified bodies outside of the United States recognize testing that is performed according to voluntary consensus standards. Therefore, manufacturers are able to rely, at least in part, on those documents to guide the execution of testing. So what are those standards and how are they used to evaluate devices for MRI safety? So if we revisit our previous table that outlined the potential hazards that a device could pose to a patient, we can add another column with the corresponding standards that are used to evaluate the devices for the specific hazards listed. So the standards that are shown in bold are traditionally viewed as applicable to, again, our passive devices, while the standards shown in both bold and regular text are both applicable to, to active devices. Now, these standards should provide a good starting point for the evaluation of all devices, um, and if you want to go into greater detail, I recommend that you look at the specific documents of, of interest. So I'd like to take a pause here and just acknowledge that, in fact, when we do testing in accordance with the existing standards, then it does work for a lot of devices. In fact, thousands of devices have been evaluated using standards and with really great success. Again, as we've discussed already, these include both passive and active medical devices, such as spinal implants, uh, stents, heart valves, as well as other devices such as neurostimulators and cochlear implants, to name a few. Now, while these evaluations work, it's not to say that the approaches are easy, nor are they straightforward. Therefore, I want to highlight some of the reasons the evaluations can be burdensome. A more comprehensive discussion about these considerations, unfortunately, is beyond the scope of today's webinar, but we're happy to answer questions related to these challenges at a later time or offline. So for multi-configuration passive devices that have numerous components and that can be assembled together, such as hip, hip implants or knee implants, the number of permutations of devices that can be assembled is, is quite frankly enormous. It's therefore oftentimes not viable to simply just test all the potential configurations of constructs. Rather, in such instances, a systematic sampling plan and statistical analysis approach are almost always needed to demonstrate the worst case, that, that worst case constructs have, have been evaluated. So for example, when we think about, again, the, uh, the hips and knee, knee components, just to emphasize just how massive these undertakings, and undertakings can be, if you think of a knee system or a hip system that has eight potential different components, and of those eight components, each has six different size options available, if there's no restrictions on how those components can, get, can become assembled together, the total potential number of configurations reaches almost 1.7 million. 
Therefore, like I talked about, one of the hardest things with doing testing for passive metal devices is when there are multi-configuration devices on hand. And in such a case, a rather robust systematic sampling and statistical analysis approach is almost always needed to demonstrate the, uh, the, that worst case constructs have been evaluated for determining the appropriate labeling conditions. Now, active devices, on the other hand, are inherently much more complex than passive devices. Uh, because active devices often have numerous internal circuit components, there's the potential for complex interactions with the electromagnetic fields during MRI. Now, similar to passive devices, uh, determining the worst case configuration for active devices is also a big undertaking. However, the challenge with these types of devices is not so much related to the sheer number of configurations that can be achieved, but rather it's, it's due to the fact that long leads that extend from the IPG can be routed into a large number of configurations that need to be evaluated. Furthermore, when we think about the types of analyses that are required to evaluate active implants, they're generally just much more burdensome. Uh, some of the types of, of things that need to be done during these testing and evaluations are to build a validated simulation environment, to determine transfer functions for the devices, and to utilize human body modeling to predict the electric fields and exposure conditions to which these devices might be exposed to in the human body. So that being said, uh, testing in accordance with the existing standards, you know, while it works and it works well, it also has limitations. Uh, much of this is due to the fact that the science of MRI safety has evolved so quickly over the last decade and now we're seeing many instances where either devices aren't being evaluated against all the right standards, or the science has changed so quickly that the, that the standards used to guide all of this testing may not have kept pace. In such instances, manufacturers often find themselves in situations where they have to do more or different types of testing to demonstrate safety and compatibility of their devices. So now I'd like to use the, a, a few case studies or a few examples to to demonstrate how this might, might happen. And so to do that, we're gonna first start with uh, a, a discussion about gaps in standards. So first of all, um, when standards are, are traditionally applied to MRI testing, uh, like I said before, they've been done so with, with great success in the, in the past. However, as we are about to discuss, ASTM and ISO standards, um, while they provide a solid foundation for evaluating medical devices for MRI safety and compatibility, uh, they, there may be gaps in terms of how they're applied to different types of medical devices. In the traditional sense, when we think of the application of standards and their evaluation for MRI safety and compatibility testing for passive and active devices, we generally think of it in this way. When we think of passive devices, again, your hips and your knees, for example, we generally refer to the four standards listed here. And when we think of implanted active devices, we generally think of those same four standards as well as, all, as well as all of the different clauses that are included in the ISO 10974 document for active implantable medical devices. Now, what does this look like um, when we think about the spectrum of medical devices? Unfortunately, such a classification doesn't address the multitude of medical devices that are available across the entire spectrum of medical devices. For example, when we think of, of medical devices in the traditional sense, we think of the ones that are fully implanted, such as your hips and your knees, as well as those pacemakers and neurostimulators. However, when we look at the actual spectrum of, of medical devices, there's a huge range of, of devices that are not only fully implanted, but some of those that are also partially implanted, such as external fixation systems, feeding tubes, catheters, and the like, as well as really medical devices uh, or medical equipment that's not implanted at all. Furthermore, when we think of the traditional passive and active devices, we also need to recognize that that is again a continuum and that along that spectrum, there are certain devices that demonstrate both passive and active aspects to them. So for example, some devices may have a power source that's only connected some of the time. Uh, in such an instance, the permanent implant may be considered passive while the active component is external to the body. And in other instances, uh, a, a, a power source may be uh, just totally separate from the, the patient itself, and it may provide power to the device by remote, by remote means. So in those instances, 
Is the device considered active, passive, or somewhere in between? And in fact, in the traditional sense, if we were to overlay the standards for MRI testing against this continuum, we'd be left with a schematic that looks like this, where ASTM standards are applied to the fully implanted passive devices, and both the ISO and ASTM standards are applied to the fully implanted uh, active devices. However, such a classification leaves pretty significant gaps across the entire spectrum of medical devices. So for example, uh, there is not a standard that currently exists for partially implanted medical devices, nor is there a standard to evaluate external medical equipment. Similarly, how does a manufacturer determine MRI compatibility of implanted devices that have an external power source or power source that can be disconnected? Furthermore, there are also instances when devices quote unquote fail the evaluations according to the acceptance criteria that's specified in each of these different test methods. In such instances, it's important for the manufacturer to then consider the device from a, from a risk management and patient safety perspective. So with that being said, I'd like to focus on a few examples where we can demonstrate some of these scenarios for consideration. So the first example I'd like to start with is, is relatively benign uh, at, from a first glance. However, it's one of these, these types of devices and examples that we've seen cause headaches for, for uh, a lot of manufacturers as they've tried to achieve MRI safety and compatibility testing. So consider the example of a breast tissue marker. These markers are frequently used when treating breast tumors. They're typically inserted following biopsy of the breast, for example. Now, after a patient undergoes therapy, such as chemotherapy, to treat a tumor, the patient often undergoes follow-up diagnostic imaging. Now, during that follow-up imaging appointments, the, uh, the breast tissue markers not only serve as an excellent landmark for the cl clinician to find the appropriate image location, but they're also able to use the, the breast tissue markers to compare the size of the tumor to the previous images more easily. Now, for such a small metallic device, the common battery of tests that may be executed to determine MRI compatibility, again, are, are fairly straightforward. They are your displacement torque, RF-induced heating, and uh, MR image artifact testing. And for now, we'd like to focus on displacement testing and discuss why this causes a headache for, for people that are manufacturing these types of devices. So shown here is an example of a test method, uh, displacement testing, that's used to evaluate uh, the effects of the static magnetic field on the medical device itself. So in this situation, you can see the breast tissue marker, and if it, for example, it's made of stainless steel or has another small amount of other magnetic, magnetic material, it wouldn't be unreasonable for that marker to experience such strong magnetic forces that when it's, when it's uh, introduced to the entrance of the MR scanner bore, that it would get pulled completely horizontally as if, if, as if it was trying to be dragged into the scanner bore itself. Now, when we think about the results of this testing, the conclusion that we would be drawn from this test is that the device simply fails the evaluation for displacement. Now, before calling it quits with the device, however, again, I want to emphasize that it's important to consider this result with respect to patient safety and not just interpreting it with respect to the standard test method. So to do that, I'd like to compare the test setup to something that's uh, found in the real world to help clarify why such a result might not actually be harmful to a patient. So consider, for example, a windsock. Now, on a perfectly calm day, the windsock falls straight downwards because of the force of gravity. However, when there's enough wind, the windsock, as you can imagine, gets pulled horizontally such that it completely overcomes the force of gravity. Because the windsock is so light, as you can imagine, it also doesn't take a lot of actual force to cause it to, be, to, cause it to become horizontal. Now, when we think of this example in comparing it to the breast tissue marker itself, you can imagine that in the magnetic scanner, that the force of the wind is now replaced by the force of the magnetic field. Therefore, although this device is surely demonstrating significant displacement as a result of the magnetic force being applied to it and fails according to the standard, the actual forces that the device experiences are still likely extremely small because the device is, is, is small itself and also very lightweight. Therefore, if we were to actually compare the forces applied to the marker, with forces that would result in tissue injury to the patient, it's likely that those forces are orders of magnitude lower than those that would cause harm to the patient. If you think of it in another way, 
Imagine dropping a bowling ball and a tennis ball on your foot. Although both are applying forces to your foot, the former is likely going to hurt a lot, and, and you'll likely barely even notice the latter. Now, this is an example of a way that by providing such a justification uh, to compare displacement forces with injury forces, that it can be shown that even when a device fails some of these types of tests, that it might still be considered MR conditional. Now, the next example I want to discuss is, again, an example of a, a medical device or medical equipment where no current standard test, methods, standard test methods exist to guide how to perform this testing. So you can imagine in, in some situations, a patient may be on a ventilator and they may need to receive therapy while they're undergoing an MRI scan. Like we've already talked about, there's no standards that currently exist to guide the MRI, MRI compatibility testing of such equipment. Now, in such a scenario, the manufacturer of the equipment cannot simply go straight to a standard test method to determine how to evaluate their equipment, but instead, the testing needs to be, needs to be conducted and, and guided by the potential risks that a ventilator could experience in an MRI suite. In this case, a, several of the examples of, of potential risks could be the displacement of the ventilator as well as malfunction of the equipment. For example, as I've already talked about in the first several slides, one of the biggest concerns for any accessory medical equipment that is used in an MRI room is the danger that it could become a projectile missile. When ventilators or other medical equipment become projectiles, the end results, as you can imagine, are often catastrophic to the patients. If, therefore, a manufacturer wants the equipment to be considered conditionally safe, they'll first have to demonstrate that the ventilator can be maintained in the room without being pulled into the scanner. As we've already discussed, the magnetic fields inside the scanner are extremely high. However, outside the scanner, there are also low magnetic fields that can interact with the medical equipment, such as a ventilator. Therefore, to demonstrate that a ventilator doesn't become a projectile and also functions close to the scanner so that it can deliver therapy, a manufacturer could test the equipment at various distances and positions away from the entrance to the MRI scanner. As you might expect, the further you move away from the scanner itself, the lower the magnetic fields get. Therefore, uh, there's a likely minimum distance at which this, the, the equipment could be maintained and not pose a risk of becoming a projectile hazard. Furthermore, when considering functionality, we should not only be considering the distance from the scanner itself, but we should be considering several other factors related to functionality. For example, uh, would a ventilator or other equipment need to be oriented in such a way where the magnetic fields are, are not causing malfunction of certain components within the, uh, the equipment itself? Uh, similarly, a, a ventilator may be operated in, in several different types of, of delivery or therapy modes. And therefore, it's important to not only consider the, uh, the functionality of the device in the absence of MRI scanning in all the different scanning modes, but it's also important to consider the functionality of the equipment when the MRI scanner is actually delivering therapy and acquiring images. Now, the third example uh, is, again, much like the breast tissue marker, uh, fairly well-defined in terms of the types of tests that need to be conducted to demonstrate MRI safety and compatibility. Again, because it's a passive device, the peripheral stent uh, should be evaluated for displacement, torque, RF heating, and artifact. Now, in this case, I want to emphasize RF-induced heating because peripheral stents, unlike their counterparts that are used for coronary applications, um, are usually quite long and, as their name implies, are implanted in peripheral vasculature, for example, in, in your arms and legs. Now, in such a, a scenario, the test methods that are often described for RF heating are often insufficient to fully capture the risk of the device causing harm to the patient. For example, uh, in the traditional sense of, of testing, I, I don't think I need to do a lot to convince you that the phantom that's used for benchtop testing is really not all that representative of an actual human body. Um, obviously, the phantom doesn't capture all the anatomical nuances of the human body, uh, such as different organs and material properties. Um, it also, as you can pretty easily see, doesn't include any extremities, such as arms and legs, uh, nor does it include any physiologically relevant blood flow. Furthermore, when we think about benchtop testing to evaluate RF heating, 
it's always performed in a way that attempts to expose devices to a uniform electric field. However, in clinical scenarios, a patient uh, may be moved to different depths within the MRI scanner in order to image different anatomical regions. Therefore, in clinical use, a device that's located in a patient's extremities may be exposed to significantly different electric and magnetic fields in terms of magnitude and distribution. In such scenarios, as you can imagine, it's entirely possible that the device experiences either much harsher or much more benign conditions during tested, testing uh, that then would be predicted clinically. So in such scenarios, to better understand the conditions the device may actually experience clinically, things that we continue to see from a, from a manufacturer standpoint is the need to uh, utilize human body modeling. Um, and in this way, the method allows the incorporation of models of human bodies into a simulated MR environment. Now, by performing simulations of the patient in this type of environment, we're better able to predict the actual magnetic and electric field that a device is exposed to during scanning, as opposed to using the benchtop model as, a, as an end-all, be-all. Now, the other thing, as you can imagine, that we just talked about is the fact that, to consider the fact that uh, fluid flow and in a patient blood flow would have a significant dampening effect on the amount of heating that a, that a device experiences. So for a long slender stent that's tested using the traditional methods, you can expect that the stent will experience a significant amount of, of heating. So for example, when you test by the benchtop method, the, uh, the trace you see here in brown might be indicative of a result you, you find by doing the testing in the traditional method. It wouldn't be unreasonable, for example, for such a device to heat by 20 to 30 degrees Celsius and in such a scenario, provide a significant risk to the patient. However, if numerical simulations or, te or testing were performed that incorporated uh, the stent as well as the pre presence of relevant blood flow conditions, you can imagine that the predicted temperature increase may reduce by easily an order of magnitude like you see here. So this is an, an example now when we think about evaluating devices where the types of tests and evaluations that need to be performed are actually more significant than what is prescribed in the standard test methods. So in a situation such as this, uh, the benchtop testing uh, would likely significantly overestimate the amount of heating and suggest that the device is really unsafe for use in, in a patient population. Therefore, in these types of situations, it's up to the manufacturer to not just rely on that benchtop testing, uh, but to uh, rely on other methodologies such as human body modeling and computational fluid dynamics to perform additional characterization and demonstrate the safety of their device in an MR environment. Now, I want to touch on one more example uh, to, to demonstrate some of the ways that MR uh, testing has been evolving uh, over the, the last decade and, and really recently in the last couple of years. So I want to consider a scenario uh, and really to emphasize where different and more clinical imaging modalities may be desired as part of a manufacturer's workup to demonstrate MRI safety and compatibility. So for this, I'd like to use an example of a neurovascular embolization coil. These coils, as you can see in the figure on the bottom left, uh, are often deployed into aneurysms, and their, their application and their intended use is to occlude blood flow. Now, this is an example of a device that is often imaged clinically with much different scan sequences than those that are tested in the benchtop experimentally. So before we go into the example, let's discuss what image artifacts might look like. Shown here are two examples, examples of MR images that were acquired of intrauterine devices with different scan sequences. As can be seen from the image, really specifically on the right, when testing is done in accordance with the prescribed standard, uh, the output of that test might be uh, a huge amount of artifact that really doesn't convey any practically useful information because the artifact is just so large. So what is a, a manufacturer to do and, and how might this play out in, in, the, uh, in the example of the neurovascular embolization coil? So if we consider this coil and we assume that it's been tested according to the ASTM standard, we would expect that the manufacturer would measure a specific amount of artifact. 
Now, if we think about a patient who's undergoing uh, an MRI a a that has a, a, the same coil that's been implanted, the output of that MR image would likely have a, a, a black spot, much like we just saw from several slides before, that uh, needs to be interpreted by the, by the attending clinician or the radiologist. Now, in the images of the patient, there's a likelihood that the presence of the dark spot near the aneurysm could be one of two things. And when we think about the options of what, the, what those interpretations might be, we will look at it in, in one of two ways. One is that it's, it's a black spot that arises from the presence of the medical device. In essence, it's image artifact. Secondly, uh, it may actually be due to a blockage of the vessel itself. So in doing testing per the standard, a manufacturer likely would perform the analysis, uh, again, with a totally different scan sequence than what's used clinically. In this instance, it's entirely possible that in the clinical setting that the artifact is, is actually much smaller like you see here because of differences between the MR scan sequences used between the benchtop execution of testing and the scan sequence that's used to image the patient itself. However, if we're in a situation where the manufacturer has only performed testing according to the standard and has included language in their labeling that suggests that the artifact from the device would be much larger than that seen in the images, so again, if you compare the, the top left schematic of a large artifact relative to a potential output of, of, the, uh, of the device itself, it's entirely possible that the clinician may actually interpret the image as a blockage because the, the image that's seen it from the patient is indeed much smaller than what was measured experimentally. Now, in that type of scenario, like we talked about previously, the next steps may be for that clinician to reoperate on the patient, further exposing them to an unnecessary surgical risk. So in such a, a scenario, it may actually be more desirable for the manufacturer of these devices to perform testing on a bench top that more cl closely matches actual clinical scenarios. Now that can be done in, in a couple of different ways. First, by using the clinically relevant scan sequence. And second, by incorporating a test setup where the uh, scenario and the, and the test environment most closely matches the material properties of the patient itself, him, himself or herself. Now by doing so, it may be easier for a clinician to diagnose the unknown signals artifact rather than attributing it to a blockage and recommending unnecessary surgical intervention. So hopefully that gives a, 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 an example of some of the different ways in which current standard test methods may not be fully comprehensive and also scenarios where additional testing and characterization may need to be done to demonstrate safety of medical devices in an MRI scanner. So after all this testing is done, the final output from any of this work is to prepare the appropriate labeling for the device or the equipment. Now devices and equipment should be labeled either MR safe, MR conditional, or MR unsafe, depending on the results of the testing. Generally speaking, the only devices that are labeled MR safe are those that just don't have any metal components whatsoever. And devices and equipment that are MR conditional are those that can be scanned safely, but only under a specific set of conditions. Finally, MR unsafe devices, as the name implies, are not safe for use in or around MR scanners. So for MR conditional devices, uh, it's important to, get, to ensure that the appropriate restrictions are included in the labeling to ensure a patient implanted with a particular device is not exposed to unsafe MRI conditions. So all of the work that was just done that we just talked about is for us to better understand what those conditions are and what those limitations in the labeling need to be. Examples of the information and restrictions that might be included in a label include things like the scanner strength, 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla, uh, for example, the maximum allowable spatial gradient, the different types of scanning modes, types of scanners, limitations to patient positioning inside the scanner, allowable scan duration, maximum allowable gradient slew rate, and amount of image artifact that might be expected from a medical device that's implanted inside of a patient. However, this is by no means an all-inclusive list. And if we revisit some of the examples that we talked about here just recently, 
we can show some more specific examples of what might be included for different types of devices when additional testing is done. So for example, in the case of a ventilator, if it's going to be located outside of the MRI scanner, labeling should include some information as to how close that equipment can be placed next to the MRI scanner, and likely will also include some additional safeguards that specify and require that, that equipment to be tethered either to a wall or other permanent fixture just to make sure there's an additional level of safety to ensure that it doesn't become a projectile and, and get sucked into the MRI scanner. The other thing that we talked about with the ventilator specifically is that it may have different therapy modes. And if there's one therapy mode that is conditional and, and can be utilized during MRI scanning, while other operation modes cannot, but that type of information should also be included into labeling. In the case of the neurovascular embolization coil, on the other hand, we may include additional language that's specific to the additional artifact characterization that was performed. Uh, and in doing so, this type of language would better guide a clinician into the interpretation of his or her images such that they can feel confident in their diagnosis and recommendation for subsequent treatment to the patient itself, him or herself or herself. So to wrap up everything we, we just talked about, again, when we think about MRI safety and compatibility testing, the biggest thing to do is to consider evaluation of devices and equipment, not just from the execution of standards and per uh, relevant test methods, but rather to really view it through the lens of risk management and patient safety. When doing MRI testing, it's always better to start earlier in the design process. Uh, so by incorporating testing early on, there's a better ability to make design changes in a device that makes it safer and more compatible with an MRI scanner. If testing is, for example, done too late in the development process, after the, the design has been frozen, and we find out from testing that the device is actually unsafe and incompatible with an MRI scanner, the device may either have to undergo additional testing, have more restrictive labeling, or even undergo complete redesign. And the last takeaway that, that we really want to emphasize here is that as the science of MRI testing continues to evolve, and as devices continue to become more complex, additional testing burdens are, are likely going to fall on manufacturers to demonstrate safety. Examples of more complex analyses include human body modeling, like we just talked about, adapting testing to more clinically relevant situations, uh, and furthermore, more comprehensive testing will surely be needed to evaluate more complex devices as they interact with scanners that evolve, that have new scan designs, new scan sequences, uh, and interactions with patients that are, that are incorporated um, into future designs of devices and scanners themselves. So with that being said, uh, we, we did a little bit of a flyby of MRI safety and compatibility testing with respect to medical devices. So if you have any questions at this time, I, I'd like to open up the floor for those questions now. And I'd like to also thank Medmark for, uh, for having me today, as well as for all of you that attended this, uh, this presentation. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. Uh, first, what would you say is the most uh, important input and output from an MR safety testing program? Sure, that's a, it's a great question, and it's something we run into whenever we do these evaluations. And again, if we, if we look at the definition of risks and execution of testing all the way through the MR labeling, the initial inputs that are absolutely crucial are the definition of risks, and secondly, uh, the identification of worst case scenarios. So in a family of products that have different sizes or, or different uh, indications for use, identifying those worst cases, testing those worst cases, and then the output of, of all of the testing should be the appropriate labeling that guides clinicians, scan technicians, and doctors, healthcare providers, as to what the limitations are to, uh, to using an MR scan, scanner for patients that are implanted with these devices. Could you talk a bit about why tests required by ASTM and ISO may not be sufficient? Sure, and really what, what we talked about today should help provide a little bit of clarity as to why those test methods may not be comprehensive. It's really, it, it, what it comes down to is that those test methods are meant to create a well-controlled environment where we can better understand how a device responds to an MR scanner. Uh, 
Now, as you can imagine, and I'll use the example of human body modeling to, to exemplify this, what you see on a benchtop is not always representative of what you find in a patient. So in those types of instances, uh, when you have more complex geometries, when you have different types of implant locations, large devices, or the incorporation of, of blood flow, the tests that you perform according to those standards are just really insufficient to capture all those complexities. Are there different requirements for these devices in the United States and other markets? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, ultimately, when you think about uh, the United States FDA as well as international notified bodies, when we look at the types of tests that are required to be performed, uh, we have all of the test methods that we lined up uh, as far as what can be performed for medical devices today. Those are generally accepted by, by virtually all notified bodies, both domestic in the United States as well as internationally. And those are the tests that really guide all testing for medical device safety um, for, for all types of medical devices. So in essence, the, the types of requirements and standards that you see here are generally what are required for both U.S. submissions as well as international submissions. I think we have time for just one more. Um, if a device doesn't pass one of the tests that's conducted, but the manufacturer knows that there are similar devices on the market that do have MR conditional labeling, what should they do? It's a great question, and, and we run into this uh, fairly frequently. And really, in these types of situations, um, it's, in, it's important to understand a couple things. One, the testing that's performed on your device is, is really what's going to be considered in any of these regulatory submissions. It's helpful to have additional devices or similar devices to be able to point to, to demonstrate that, they may, that they're already on the market and being utilized. However, it's not, the, it's not the data point that's going to allow a device to, to proceed through submissions. So when those, types of, when those devices fail uh, per a test method, uh, like we talked about today, usually the best approach is to go back to the drawing board and figure out if that failure is indeed a true failure that leads to um, patient safety risks, or if there's additional analyses that can be done to demonstrate that even in the light of failure, that there's other characterization and other testing that can be done to demonstrate safety. Once that's been done, pointing to additional devices that, that have uh, MR labeling that are already on the market is a great add-on and something else that can be done to further solidify safety, but is, is rarely done in a vacuum in and of itself. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.